Hey, what's up? Should we talk about hierarchical linear models? All right, I'm gonna start by uh, telling you a little story. So when I was an undergraduate, I was doing a honors thesis and I collected a sample size of 67 participants. And when I ran the analysis, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was close. It was like P is equal to 0.0832 or something like that. And back then I really cared about statistical significance because I didn't know any better. And I knew enough to know that increasing your sample size lowered your probability. And so I thought, if the only thing that's stopping me from a statistically significant result is my sample size, why not just duplicate my data? Yep. And I thought, surely there's a reason this is a bad idea. I just couldn't explain why it was a bad idea. And after a bit more experience, I realized that would have been a very bad idea. And here's why. Let me ask you, what is the probability of observing the data that I observed? Anyone? The probability is one because I observed it. The probability of any event that's already occurred is one. Now, let me ask you, if I were to collect another 67 participants, what's the probability of getting the exact same composition of data? It's practically zero. It would be extremely unlikely to get the exact same composition of scores if I collected 67 new participants. And when we compute a p-value, we're essentially asking how likely is it that we would get results like this again? So the probability of getting results exactly as we have is basically zero. But if we duplicate it, the probability is actually one. And because the p-value is estimating the probability of getting data like the data that we've got, we've basically inflated our p-value. When we compute a p-value, or really when we do any sort of statistical procedure that uses probabilities, we are assuming independence. Independence. Now you might be asking yourself, Hey dude, why are you talking about duplicates? Nobody wants to duplicate their data. And you're right, except for people who are extremely misinformed, like I was. Nobody's trying to duplicate their data. But there are situations where we expect duplicates of some sort. For example, if you were to ask my opinion on some of the recent Supreme Court decisions, you'd get some very strong opinions. But then you'd ask a random stranger, and their results might be similar, or they might be dissimilar. And basically, there's no way to predict what that person's scores are gonna be from my scores. But if you were to ask my brother, his opinions would be very similar to my opinions. Why? Because we grew up in the same house. We have the same parents, we have the same genetics. And so asking his opinion is kinda like duplicating my data. Or another example, let's say you ask my opinion today on the Supreme Court's decisions, and then you ask me in six months the exact same questions. My responses in six months are gonna be super correlated with my responses now. Whereas if you ask my opinion now and somebody else's opinion six months from now, they're not gonna be correlated whatsoever. And in these situations, we violated the assumption of independence. So there are some common situations that we come across in stats. So we repeatedly ask people the same questions. When you do that, your responses are gonna be correlated with one another. Or sometimes you might be sampling family members. You ask the husbands and then you ask the wives. Or you ask the older brother and then the younger brother. And of course their scores are gonna be correlated. Or another common situation is when you have some sort of clustering. Like for example, when you have a bunch of students taught by the same teacher. So when we have scores that are correlated, we call it clustering. Clustering, clustering. And before we continue, a word from our sponsor. Sponsor? Oh, well, that's right, it's me. <laughs> This video is brought to you by NordVPN, Squarespace, and Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> Just kidding. No, it's brought to you by me. If you want to learn about mixed models from me personally, then you can take my online course. We could either do a self-guided course where you go to a Canvas course and it gives you quizzes and discussion boards and that sort of thing, and you learn at your own pace. Or you can take a live class where you get to ask me questions through Zoom, and I get a chance to walk you step by step through a bunch of practice quizzes and exercises and that sort of thing. And you get to ask questions of me and we get to hang out and stuff. So if you are interested, please visit simplistics.net. I will see you there. So here's the deal. If we violate the assumption of independence, we can't just pretend that didn't happen. We have to deal with it. So back in the day, we used to use what's called a repeated measures ANOVA to handle this problem. And I'm not gonna go into the details of how that was done. 
it basically adjusted the p-value based on how correlated the data were, um, but it also assumed something called sphericity, which is a very unlikely assumption. Or is it compound symmetry? I can't remember which, but it doesn't matter. That's how we used to do things. But now there is a much simpler method, a much simpler way of dealing with correlated data. So back in the 1990s, there was a lot of development in what we call hierarchical linear models or mixed models or multi-level models, also known as super models. Just kidding. These models have basically made repeated measures ANOVAs obsolete. These models, these mixed models, handle missing data naturally. They don't require you to measure people at fixed time points like the ANOVA method did. And they're so much more flexible. So with that, shall we talk about mixed models? Once again, mixed models go by many names, hierarchical linear models, multi-level models, mixed effects models, mixed models. They're basically all the same thing. So there are common situations where mixed models are necessary. So mixed models or hierarchical linear models are necessary whenever you have clustering in the data. And let's go through a couple more examples. You might collect data from clients who have the same therapist, like Dr. Collins' clients, and Dr. Smith's clients, and Dr. Kevorkian's clients. <laughs> All those clients may be correlated because they have the same therapist. Or maybe you collect data from classrooms. And again, all of Mrs. Russell's students are probably gonna be similar because they have the same teacher. Or you collect measurements from the same person over four measurement points, or five, or 10, or whatever. And again, your scores today are gonna be correlated with your scores tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year, whatever. And sometimes we represent this sort of clustering as visual like this. So here we got Dr. Russell's clients, patient one, patient two, and patient three, Dr. Smith's clients, patient four, five, and six, etc. And if you were to look at the data in a spreadsheet format, it would look like this. And this is what we call long format as opposed to wide format. If you're interested in the difference, I will link to a video that describes the difference and shows how to go from one to the other. Basically, when you do mixed models, it requires you to have the data in long format. And here's another clustering visual, this time representing repeated time points. So there's Dustin at time one, time two, and time three. That's me! And then Matt at time one, time two, and three. And Lexi at time one, time two, and time three. Lexi is my dog's name. Uh, you don't care. So there are two reasons hierarchical linear models are necessary. One, because p-values will be vastly biased if we don't take care of the clustering. That's what we already talked about. But also, there's a second reason. It's because the nature of those relationships might be very deceiving if we treat the data points as if they're independent. So let's look at an example of that. Let's say we have a scatter plot like this that looks at symptom severity on the x-axis and the proportion of people who survive on the y-axis. And if we were to fit a model, we would say, wow, look at that. The more severe your symptoms, the more likely you are to survive. That seems kind of weird. On the other hand, if we color code the dots, what do we find? Yeah. So these colors represent different hospitals. There's in and out in red, Cyprus in green, and University Medical in blue. And so it looks like from this graph that University Medical only takes patients with severe symptoms and in and out really only takes people who don't have severe symptoms. But within the hospital, you see a negative relationship that the more severe the symptoms, the less likely they are to survive like this. And so here, the different colors represent the lines for each of the individual hospitals, whereas the black line represents the average of the three. That's essentially what mixed models are doing. We call these colored lines the random effects, or the random effects are the cluster level fitted lines. And then we call this black line here the fixed effect, which is the average across all the clusters. Once again, this is essentially what mixed models do. They fit separate lines for each cluster. They then aggregate those lines to estimate the average effect or the fixed effect. Now, technical caveat. Is it caveat or caveat? Or caviar? I can never remember. Caveat. I'll say it like that. Hmm. Then it sounds more natural. Otherwise, it sounds weird. Coming up my tongue. Again, technical caveat. We don't actually fit separate regression lines for each cluster. The cluster lines are biased towards the fixed effect, but you really don't need to know that. I'm just saying that so that people don't correct me in the comments because it embarrasses me. You're embarrassing me in front of my friends. Too late. So let me just summarize what I've talked about so far. If we treat individuals within clusters as if they're independent data points, we're gonna screw things up. Our p-values are gonna be biased. They're gonna be artificially low. And we may miss important relationships like in that hospital example. And again, HLM or mixed models, more or less, fit separate lines for each individual cluster. But there are situations where we don't want R to fit a separate line for each individual cluster. We want everybody's line to be the same or maybe everybody's slope to be the same. And I'll show you examples of those in a minute. And so when we don't allow the slopes, for example, to vary within cluster, we call that a fixed effect. Fixed meaning everyone's parameter is the same. 
and the ones that are free to vary, we call them random effects. So again, fixed, same for everyone, or the average of everyone, and then random, unique for each individual cluster. And sometimes you want to fix a parameter. So let's think of an example where you actually don't want separate slopes for each of the individual clusters. One theory in exercise science is that the relationship between calories consumed and weight gain is constant, assuming you have the same metabolic rate. It doesn't matter whether you go to school A or school B. It doesn't matter whether you have therapy with Dr. A or Dr. B. If you have the same metabolism, the relationship between calories consumed and weight gain is identical. The slopes are fixed. They do not change. And it doesn't matter whether you measure me now, in the future, or six months from now. Assuming my metabolism doesn't change, the relationship between the two is the same. So wouldn't it be nice to have the flexibility to model that? You can. So here's our graph before, where we saw some variation in the slopes, but if we theoretically have a reason to believe that they should be fixed, here's what it might look like when we fix the slopes. In this first graph, we call those random slopes. In the second graph, we call those fixed slopes because the slopes are all exactly the same. So very often we have what are called random slopes and random intercepts, meaning that every cluster gets their own unique slope and their own unique intercept but we could also have a random intercept only model, meaning the slopes are fixed, which is what I showed you before. And these models are actually pretty common. So like I talked about, the calorie and weight loss example, or maybe you have a new teaching intervention that you're applying to a bunch of different schools and you have no reason to suspect that the difference between those who are treated versus not changes depending on the cluster. So maybe you're trying to estimate the difference between male and female math scores. And you have no reason to suspect that the difference between males and females differs depending on the school. So with categorical predictors, you could fix the slope too. And actually it's very common to fix the slopes. And in this case, the slope is the difference between the two groups. Or maybe there's another situation where you have therapists with a bunch of clients and you randomly decide that half the client should get this new therapeutic method and the other half should not. And maybe you have no reason to suspect that Dr. John's patients are gonna have a larger difference than Dr. Jones's patients. So for each of these examples, we've assumed that the intercepts are random, meaning like, for example, if we're talking about the doctors, Dr. Jones's clients have a different mean depression level or whatever. So they're allowed their different means, but the mean difference between the treated and untreated stays the same. So in this case, the slopes are fixed or the mean differences are fixed, but the intercepts are allowed to vary. Now you could do the other way around where you assume everybody has the same mean, but different slopes. So that might look like this and notice all these regression lines start at the same point and just deviate from there. This is rare. I've actually never seen this in practice where you fix the intercepts, but allow the slopes to vary. And I can't think of why you would do this at all. So why am I even showing it to you? I'm just showing it to you so you know what it means to fix a parameter versus allow it to be random. So what? What is the take home message here? Almost always we allow the intercepts to vary. And then every time we're adding a predictor to our model, we have to ask ourselves: hmm, are the slopes gonna be consistent across clusters? If so, we should probably model that slope as a fixed effect, meaning every cluster gets the same slope. If not, we should model it as a random slope, meaning every cluster gets their own unique slope. But sometimes we don't even have a choice. Sometimes we don't have enough data to actually allow a slope to vary. And if you're more interested in that problem, see the video linked in the description. And that video will help you decide whether to model a parameter as a fixed or a random slope. Let's go ahead and test your knowledge and see if you can identify fixed versus random intercepts and slopes and stuff. First plot, what is this? So in this situation, notice they're not all originating from the same point and notice the slopes are different. So we would say both the intercepts and the slopes are random. Notice all of those lines are parallel. So in this situation, we can confidently say that yes, this is a fixed slope model where the intercepts are allowed to randomly vary. And let's look at another one. This is one of those weird ones that you would not expect to see very often in practice where the intercepts are clearly fixed, but the slopes are allowed to vary. And let's look at another one. What is this doing? Well, this is another instance where both the intercepts and the slopes are different for each group. So we have a random slopes and intercept model. 
probably the most common type of model. And let me again emphasize that we almost never do a fixed intercept. So with that, Let's go ahead and review the learning objectives. One, the assumption of independence and why it's important, as well as the idea of duplicating your data set. And again, if you violate the assumption of independence, it's like artificially duplicating your data set, which is a bad idea. Two, what are the two consequences of violating the assumption of independence? One is that your p-values are gonna be artificially low, so you're more likely to make a type one error. And also you might miss important relationships. Number three, understand the difference between mixed models, hierarchical linear models, multi-level models, mixed effects models, and there is no difference. They're the same thing. Number four, understand geometrically what mixed models are doing. And once again, they're basically fitting different regression lines for each of the clusters and then averaging them together. Ish. Also understand what fixed and random effects are. So random effects are the individual slopes for each of the clusters and fixed effects is the aggregate of those individual clusters. And fixed effects are really the average effect across all clusters. Just like in this visual we saw before. Number six, know how these different types of models would visually look basically. Random slopes and intercept model looks like this. All the slopes are different across clusters as well as the intercepts. Random slopes model, which looks like this, which means that the slopes are allowed to vary, but the intercepts stay fixed. And then we've got random intercepts model where the slopes are fixed and then the intercepts are allowed to vary. And the last learning objective is that we really don't ever use random slopes models. Or in other words, we don't use fixed intercept models. That's just weird. Unless you have a very good theoretical reason to do so. Ah. So I, I, I just finished editing this video and, and I forgot to do the thing. You know that. I, I can't. I, I just can't end a video like that. So, um, I apologize. Peace out.